crystal meth, ice, speed, crank. Methamphetamine has many street names. The illegal drug is highly addictive and affects people from all walks of life. Numbers indicate a continual rise in meth use in Hawaii, and the state consistently ranks among the highest in meth abuse in the nation, with thousands needing treatment for addiction. So what can be done in this fight against meth? Tonight's live broadcast and live stream of insights on PBS Hawaii start now. Aloha and welcome to Insights on PBS Hawaii. I'm Yanji Denise. It's been called the forgotten killer. Crystal meth has been overshadowed in recent years as other highly addictive drugs like opioids captured headlines. But meth is still the illicit drug of choice here in Hawaii. According to the Honolulu Medical Examiner's Office, drug-related deaths in Honolulu hit a five-year high last year. Of the 197 deaths in 2020, methamphetamine was the cause of 148 of them. With hospitalizations and overdoses on the continual rise, can we stop this poisoning of paradise? That's what we're asking our panel tonight. We look forward to your participation in tonight's show. You can email, call, or tweet your questions, and you'll find a live stream of this program at pbshawaii.org and on the PBS Hawaii Facebook page. Now to our guests. Matthew Viola was recently appointed Senior Family Court Judge after serving as presiding court of Judge of Drug Court, Veterans Treatment Court, Mental Health Court, and the Hope Probation Program. Prior to becoming a First Circuit Court Judge, he was a District Family Court Judge. Major Philip Johnson is the commander of the Narcotics Vice Division for the Honolulu Police Department. He's been in the division for 10 years and, as a lieutenant with HPD, led a multi-agency anti-drug task force. He holds a master's degree from Boston University. Hannah Preston Pita is a licensed clinical psychologist and is the CEO of the Big Island Substance Abuse Council. The organization was started in 1964, offering alcoholism counseling and a small halfway house. It's since expanded to an accredited program addressing substance abuse and mental health issues. And Eddie Mercercero is the administrator for the Department of Health's Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. He's a licensed clinical social worker and a Hawaii State Certified Substance Abuse Counselor. He earned his Master of Social Work from the University of Hawaii. Thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate all of your participation. Um, I want to start with you, Major Johnson. Tell us how big of an issue is this in our community right now? It's a huge issue um, for a number of reasons. The, the enterprise of meth um, keeps my personnel busy just with investigations, interdiction, and, and the whole enterprise of it. And I'm sure other panel members can contribute to all the effects of it, you know, from the user you know, all the way up to the trafficker that, I, that we target. Hannah, let's talk about what this drug actually does to you and how addictive it is. Um, how, how long does it take to get addicted and, and what is it actually doing to you physically? Oh, interestingly enough, you think about it, it can be that first time that they use, they get, they get addicted. So it really hits the, the dopamine, those receptors in your brain that, you know, the, the feel good receptors. And so when they get that high, they tend to like it, use more, and then it becomes an addiction. And what about it, what, what is appealing about it? Um, I think it's just what happens, the effects of it. So the, the behaviors that, that happen, so things like could be weight loss. I hear for females, a lot of it has to do with weight loss. You know, some of them will start using it if it's like mothers to stay awake you know, those types of things. Um, others, like the energy that, that's involved, or if they're in um, jobs that require them to be on, you know, often, they'll take it to stay awake. It's so interesting, Judge Viola, let's talk about, you know, what she's saying. She, she mentioned mothers, women who want to lose weight, people who are working jobs. What's the profile of the person who comes before you in, in court? All of those and more, it, it, it's, um, the, the court I, the drug court I work in, um, we, is comprised of criminal defendants, most of whom are on probation, um, but there's no particular profile. I think it's much more pre predominantly male. It's reflective of the population in the criminal justice system. But you, you, it, it hits all types of people, all classes of people. It does not distinguish among socioeconomic class, race, gender. 
it hits almost everybody. And how do people typically get introduced to this drug? Is this something, you know, when Hannah's talking about, it sounds like something sort of like a utility as opposed to like a party drug. Can, can you tell us sort of what, how, how people encounter this drug at first? Um, I think same answer in all kinds of ways. Mm -hmm. um, some people start, you know, have many people who started when they were kids. And, on, and, and honestly, I think it's endemic in our community. So you see it at school, you'd be surprised. Families, sort of people get antisocial kind of um, acquaintances. Some people use it because, like Dr. Preston Peter says, it, it helps them function, at least in the beginning, on a day-to-day -day basis because of the, 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 the initial effects. So I, I think there are many pathways to get introduced to methamphetamine like many other drugs. Um, Eddie, I want to ask you about breaking that addiction. What's the most effective treatment for this, and do we have enough treatment options here in the islands? Well, the, first, the second part of it is we don't, and we don't have enough treatment options. And I think the, the issue with that is that um, we need to start treating substance use disorders, especially methamphetamine use disorder, as a broad uh, clinical disease, just like we would cancer, diabetes, that kind of thing. Um, and the, the uh, unfortunately, with methamphetamine use disorders, we don't have good um, medication-assisted therapies like we do with opioids. And part of the reason why we're, we're seeing fairly low uh, opioid prevalence in the state of Hawaii as compared to the mainland is because we're, we've done a really good job because we've had, we have those tools available. We have naloxone, we have methadone, we have suboxone. With methamphetamine, it's a little bit more difficult for us to find those medication-assisted therapies. And then the, the treatment uh, modalities that we utilize are um, effective to a degree, but with methamphetamine, unfortunately, like Hannah is saying, sometimes at, with the first use, um, it can trigger a physi physiological dependence. And then from there, especially with long-term use, it takes, almost, it takes a much longer time for people to start to um, engage in recovery and stay in recovery. So absent those other kinds of tools that you were mentioning, like methadone for mm -hmm. opioid addiction, what is the sort of course of treatment and how long does it take for someone typically, I know that every person is probably different, yeah. but typically how long does it take to be able to transition off of these drugs? The average length of stay for people with methamphetamine, in, uh, methamphetamine use disorder and treatment is about six months. Uh, we need to actually expand that, but we have to also look at it from the perspective of the, the levels of care. So sometimes a person can be in residential treatment for three to six months, but still have a long time in outpatient treatment or um, aftercare recovery treatment. So sometimes it can take two to four years um, being engaged in some form of therapy, therapy for the the you know for it to really take and then relapse the average amount of times that especially with methamphetamine use disorder the average amount of relapse um, that people experience and relapse is when you get you, you get a period of abstinence or recovery and then for whatever reason you start using again but the average amount of times that somebody will relapse before you know, abstinence long term really takes is about seven to nine times. Seven to nine yeah. times. Yeah. Wow, Hannah, tell us a little bit about that recovery process of what he's talking about. I mean, that that rate of relapse is just unbelievable. So I think for us, in looking at um, the addiction process, we know basically that individuals require that time. I, I think it takes it takes a lifetime to get addicted. Sometimes it's going to take a lifetime to really make that change. And so individuals figure they go into treatment, everything is okay. I got treatment, I'm fine. They return to the same, you know, situation, um, same household, maybe with the with their wife or husband that's continuing to use in the same communities, and then they're back at it again. So when we're looking at treatment, the, what we've noticed that works is that there's a myriad of, of things that needs to happen. You have to look at it from a biopsychosocial, you know, and looking at the things that are really driving the addiction. And what I've found within our treatment setting is that it's not a standalone disorder. There's other underlying things that are going on. And I would say about 99% of the individuals that we treat have some sort of traumatic history 
there is something that's driving that. They've either been sexually abused, um, there is some sort of traumatic event in their life that has really um, changed it, and they've been using substances to really cope with it. So when it comes to looking at the um, trajectory of success, it's really difficult because I would say it's, it's really based on the individual. And sometimes the sad thing is we, we tend to see them they'll come in three, four, or five times. But I like to look at it from a psychologist's point of view and say that it's incremental progress that they're making along the way. People see it as like, wow, you're back in here again. I'm like, what did we learn from the last time? You know, they're making progress along the way. So it is, it's a very long term um, process when it comes to treatment. And it's going to be a lifetime of change. You know, as a judge, that has to be particularly frustrating if you're seeing the same defendant come to before you that many times. How do you know and, and what kind of punishment or what kind of treatments do you offer to someone um, to get them on the right path, knowing that there is that kind of relapse? You know, if <clears throat> you understand that's the nature of their, their disease or their addiction, that, that is part of the, the addiction, that's part of the recovery process. and and. And that's why drug, our, our drug court is minimum two years. And we don't, you know, no one um, is happy when someone relapses, but, um, but it's not unexpected. And you kind of build that into that drug court model. We, our, our drug court uh, program, like I said, is less for a minimum of two years just because of all the reasons that um, Eddie and Hannah were talking about. It's, it is a long process. And, and, and there are times when people relapse, but if they make those incremental gains, it, it, it takes a long time to undo the damage that's been done. And, and on top of it, often it's not just the substance abuse that needs to be addressed. Um, it's the reasons that cause that person to get into that situation in the first place. So I, I completely agree. Once you start peeling off the layers of the onion a little bit, you see underlying trauma long history of dysfunction, very often co-occurring mental illness that needs to be addressed. So, you know, if you work in this area, I think after a while you kind of get used to, you know, not, not being frustrated, but, um, but understand that it is a long process. And when you're trying to get people the resources that they need, mm -hmm. are you able to give them what they need given the constraints? I mean, I can't imagine that two years of that kind of um, interventions that you're talking about is certainly not cheap. Um, no. It's money well spent on the front end, for, uh, honestly. Um, but we're fortunate our drug court is a little bit, not unique, but unusual. We have our own treatment program within our drug court. We have an intensive outpatient program. I think Eddie knows about because he was there when, when Trocor first started. Um, we have a good relationship with ADAD. Um, there's just not enough treatment available. It's expensive, um, but but you know from my perspective, um, it's it pays great dividends down the road. We've got some questions coming in from our audience, and we invite you to keep talking to us because we love that. Um, John on Facebook wants to know, and I think this is a great question for Major Johnson, where is the ice coming from, and do we have meth labs here in Hawaii? Um, we don't come across so many meth labs like uh, maybe a 20, 25 years ago when you would see more reports. I'm not saying they don't exist. Um, the meth predominantly is coming from Mexico, and it's coming via... Some, some cities on the West Coast, um, like any other product we get on Hawaii, it's, it's um, coming by ship or by plane. So it's carried in, it's shipped in, comes through parcels, um, through the mail, through uh, different shipping companies. Um, as far as labs and production, I we'll see very rarely that these days concerning that. It's too easy to get uh, via other methods. And the product that we're getting, um, that's being shipped here is much higher quality than anybody can make in a lab in their garage or, or wherever. You know, it's hard to think of your agency and not think of COVID because that really is how we hear about the Department of Health these days. But I'm interested to know how the pandemic has changed what resources you're able to offer, given that all of the resources I would think, or you know, the majority of them are really focused on combating COVID. How has that, how has the pandemic changed what you're doing? And do you see increase in, in drug use uh, with the pandemic? Yeah, that's, an, that's a really actually a good question. I think, I, I think first and foremost, I look at the pandemic as 
really unfortunately both uh, an amazing in some ways an amazing opportunity for us to really look at our systems and really see how our systems respond to not just the pandemic of COVID but also the peripheral impacts of COVID. People are isolated, people are, people's jobs are getting impacted, um, mental health um, issues are on the rise, substance use issues are on the rise. So it's a good opportunity for us to look at where the pukas are in our system. Um, it's also had a lot of negative impacts in that, uh, you know, some of the, a lot of the focuses have been on COVID very, very validly that, that we need to kind of deal with that crisis first. But we also need to understand that the um, residual impacts of COVID on things like substance abuse and, me and mental health and homelessness are, are we're going to start, we're going to continue to see that for half a decade, a decade. Um, interestingly, COVID has allowed us to receive um, expanded funding from the federal government with the ARP, with ARPA and the Support Act and, and CARES before that. Um, so we're actually, that's a, that's a positive, so that's a silver lining. Another silver lining is, um, is telehealth. We've, we've actually really seen, and Hannah was talking about it a little earlier, we've actually seen a lot more receptiveness to engagement and treatment via telehealth. So we're really looking at ways that we can kind of take the lessons that we've learned from COVID and, and apply them long term to our system of care. Yeah, Hannah, build on that for us. What, how has COVID impacted what you do? And, you know, he's talking about maybe an upside there. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with Eddie. I'll, I'll agree with you this time. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, but we have seen some positivity come out of it. And I think what, what it's given us is the opportunity to look at things that we never saw before. Um, to really tap into resources and be creative about it. Um, one of the things that our agency has done is we, we're on the big island. Can you imagine how it is with resources? I mean, we talk about it here on this island, but when you're going to rural pockets, underserved communities, it's very difficult to get the resources that you need. And so we're having to be creative. COVID has allowed us to really test the, the waters there. So telehealth services has been really great. We're able to go into people's homes, give them the services, and they're like 100 miles away. They could be, you know, in their homes getting getting the, the services that they need. And are they as effective? Because there is something that is gained with this in-person relationship, and I would think particularly with a therapist. I would say there is, there's positives and there is negatives. I think one of the, the positives, obviously, is having the ability to connect with the individuals. But you're right, it doesn't have that human quality as much, you know, that in-person quality. So I would I would agree. There's a question here, uh, Mark and Kalihi wants to know, and, and Judge, I'll take this to you because you've interacted with a number of meth users over your, your time uh, at the court. Can regular meth users be functional in society, and if so, for how long? That's from Mark and Kailua. I'll, I'll give you my perspective, and maybe Eddie and Hannah um, maybe answer that question more fully. There are a lot of people I think can function at some level, maybe for the short term, using methamphetamine. I haven't seen too many people use it for a long time with and being able to function in the same kind of way. But it's there, a lot of people, you know, in my core are working and occasionally they will test positive for methamphetamine. Um, so it's very prevalent in the community. A lot of people are, can use it um, from time to time. Um, I think over the long term, it's, it's given, given all the damage that it does neurologically, behaviorally, it's really hard to function at any kind of level that someone would want to function um, over an extended period of time of use. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, Eddie, yeah. is there such thing as a casual meth user? There is, there is. I, I, I totally agree with Judge. I mean, I think, I think w with all of this, and s similar to there's such thing as a functional um, type 2 diabetic, right? So, so, you know, any kind of chronic disease or illness like this, you can function with uh, behaviors that are counterintuitive to being healthy for a period of time and then after a while it starts to take its toll both physiologically and socially and then also I, I would just also want to add like from from the perspective of um, law enforcement right you're if if you're trying to um, you be a functional use methamphetamine in a functional way you're still taking risks um, and, and getting engaged in the, with, with law, with the law. So sooner or later, that's going to catch up. 
There's a caller from Hilo who wants to know, and I think this is a great question for you. Can one of the panelists explain how people actually take meth? Is it smoked or injected? And there's another question. Eric wants to know, what is crystal meth or ice? What is in it? Do users really know? I, as far <laughs> as what it is, uh, it's, it's highly addictive. It's a stimulant. Um, it's cheaper than cocaine. It's um, easy to obtain. That's why it's such a problem here in Hawaii. As far as how it's... I think the method of choice is smoking it, um, heated, and um, inhaling it. Um, there's other people inject it. There's a, there's a lot of different different ways to use methamphetamine. Um, and as far as a functional uh, meth user, uh, probably the ones that I deal with mostly in law enforcement and my counterparts, you know, in, in other areas of the police department, are those who think they can function until they have to beg, borrow, and steal to get their drugs. And I think that's the the side of it that I see more than more than maybe the the positive uh, side where they're getting treatment and getting better. Um, most of the crimes I I would say that people commit, property crimes, um, burglaries, car thefts, purse snatching. There's got to be some drug nexus there, whether it's to get money to buy drugs, to get their next fix. Um, those are the individuals that I think we send to a judge's way, you know, for the drug court, those who see it as a time that they can get help and, and try to recover from it. And how easily available is it in our community right now? Um, we could go outside and I could show mm -hmm. you. I mean, I'm sure we could find meth within blocks of here easily, really? yes. And, and you talked about the price point. I mean, you mentioned earlier that, that there are even, you know, kids who can afford to use this. this is, it sounds like it's pretty cheap. Yeah, it's easy to obtain and it's yeah, it's not expensive for the for the addict for the user. Yes. You know, given all of that, Hannah, when someone is trying to get off of this drugs, if I can get it within a few blocks of wherever of I am, and it's not expensive, um, and you know, it sounds like it's fairly easy to obtain. How do we break that cycle? How how are people successful so they don't have those seven to nine relapses? Yeah. So I think it's always one of the things that we try to teach them is changing people, places, and things. You know, changing your environment, the people that you, you're with um, is one of those ways. And other things, it's having this dialogue with people who, who really matter, you know, getting the drug court. We are very successful. Our clients who go through drug court on the big island, very successful because they have that support to do that. Um, having law enforcement to sort of not be the more so punitive, but having that understanding and saying, hey, we need to get you some help. Had, having individuals like Eddie um, at ADAD to understand that, yeah, we can do this, but we need more funding to kind of drive, um, drive treatment. Um, <clears throat> there's another question from Facebook. Uh, Judge, this one is a good one for you. It says, ICE Batu has been here in Hawaii since the late 1980s. What are we doing different to combat and treat? When this first encounter, you know, came into our community, what was the approach then, and how is it different now? I, I can speak from the the core perspective. The um, <clears throat> kind of you know emphasize now much more um, of the sort of the therapeutic treatment um, approach. Um, one of the one of the great things about drug court is. You know, we have the coercive power of the court to keep, to get people into treatment in the first place, whether they want to or not. And I think a lot of research, research shows that you know, if you don't want to go to treatment, if you start and you, and you stay there, you know, for many people it will take hold, so to speak. Um, and um, and you know, we can do that because if you don't, there are consequences, which include going to jail and going to prison. So we have that you know, um, that tool. But we also take a, you know, a therapeutic approach too, because like Hannah and Eddie and, and Major were saying, it's, it's um, you know, I would tell our, our participants that they need to create a life that they value more than the life that they came from. Mm -hmm. And they, when they have some success, when they see that they, you know, yes, yeah, some of them, you know, they, they hit their 90 day mark of, of being, uh, you know, testing negative, being clean. Say, hey, when was the last time that happened to you? I can't remember. And then they build on that success and they start to see the value of it and they, they start to create a life for themselves that, um, that they value more. And, and so it takes a little bit of tough love. It takes some opportunity, give them an opportunity to succeed. And then 
you know, make sure that they do everything else they're supposed to do to become productive citizens. Hey, you've got to get a job. Mm-hmm. You've got to get a payroll job. Um, you have to come to court and show up on time. You have to, you know, take care of your family. You don't have your GED. You've got to start working for your GED. So that after they're done with treatment with our court, they have some foundation that they can, some history of success, and some of the basic foundation so that if they choose to continue down that path, they can do it. And anyway, so I think over time, that's, that's why drug court started, because the way we used to do it, way back when um, there was a war on drugs in the late 80s and 90s, and it was a purely punitive approach, I think you know, most people, whatever your perspective, realize that that was by and large ineffective so we need to do something different in drug courts. We've been around for 25 years, 26 and years. Kind of building on that, Pat on Maui has a question, and we've been talking a lot about um, the, you know, from a from a drug user's perspective. But this is a question about drug dealers, and and sometimes they're obviously the same, but perhaps not always. So Pat wants to know why are sentences for drug dealers so lenient, and they are let off with a wrist slap? There should be harsher penalties to keep them from continuing to deal drugs in the communities. We've been talking a lot about drug court in terms of the user. But what about the dealers and the penalties there? So I, I think there are, and, and Major can probably uh, amplify on this, there are a range of, of types of dealing. You know, many people who are used will deal on a low level to, to make money and, um, and get by. There are other ones who do it for a much different business purpose. It's, it's a bit of perspective. I think some of the the punishments for dealing. Our, our laws do distinguish between someone who has, who is a user and a possessor, and someone who's dealing. You know, even if they possess uh, drugs, if the intent is to to distribute it, you know, a serious felony offense. You can go away for 10, 20 years. And is that effective, sending people away for 10, 20 years? Because there are so also questions here who say that you know arresting people is not helping, and and on and on. Well, so, I mean, we have both sides of that debate. Yeah, right it's, it's a. Co- yeah. I think it's probably a, it's it's a complicated issue and a, um, a nuanced answer. But I mean, certainly some people need to go to prison, you know, because they're not going to they create harm in the community, and <clears throat> others who you know, they may have done some bad things. But they can be redeemed, and and they can they can turn into productive, law-abiding citizens. I, it's just much more cost-effective, and over the long term, you know, those the, even the individuals who are sent, given the, the harshest punishments and go to prison, well, guess what? They come out of prison, and they recidivate at a very high rate. So, you know, can it be effective at times. Sure, Do some people deserve it. Sure. Um, is it the best way to go for someone whose primary reason for being involved in the criminal justice system and being, you know, having committed the crimes they did? Is it because mainly it's because they have a substance abuse and related issues? Well, I think, you know, there's a good argument to uh, to be made that they sh- they it's more productive um, for them to be able to live out in the community on probation and get treatment so that they don't continue to commit the crimes that they committed in the past. Major, we've got another uh, set of law enforcement questions. Um, These are both actually from people who live in Waikiki. Warren in Waikiki says the drug problem in Waikiki is getting worse with less policing and more tolerance of people using drugs in public. John in Waikiki says there are squatters in a vacant apartment using and dealing drugs near me in Waikiki. How can I get rid of them? We know that the Honolulu Police Department is short several hundred officers. Do you have enough resources on your end to do enforcement for John and Warren and, you know, the neighbors that that obviously feel like they're suffering? Um, Yes, I think we do, and we do what we can. Um, I I think we shared a a phone number they can call for um, houses just like... Yeah, and we'll put that up right there. uh, I I encourage them to call. As much information they can give us about the location, about the people involved, as much as they want to be involved in that, we'll take that information. If they want to remain anonymous, that's fine too. Um, we'll take that and we will investigate. We investigate every complaint um, as, as your caller made. As far as the resources, um, uh, these are tough times, I think, in every every field, especially law enforcement. We're doing the best we can with the personnel we have and, and the money we have. And we do have to prioritize. And, you know, an encampment of homeless people doesn't necessarily mean that there's drug dealing and that going on. Um, I'm not saying it's not there, but it, 
it, it's something that we will we will look at and we take it every complaint serious. Uh, there's a question actually following up to how you were saying that these drugs are coming from Mexico. Uh, the caller says, please expand on the suppliers, specifically other countries where they are, the suppliers of meth that is imported to Hawaii. And there was another question asking about, um, I just had here. Oh, I have a person I have sponsored who got two pounds of ice in a shipment airmail, why is it so easy? Does Hawaii have the manpower to overlook shipping and air cargo? That's from Les on Facebook. Um, <clears throat> to answer both of those in one answer, um, no, we don't have all the resources. However, we do tackle it. Our first strategy in tackling this problem is interdiction. At our airport, um, I have a canine detail. We have a task force that our personnel, our sheriff's personnel, and uh, the Drug Enforcement Administration, we all team together on a task force for interdiction. Um, we, we partner with U.S. Postal, FedEx, UPS, e every way that it's coming in. We take a lot of drugs out of circulation that way, a lot of poundage. A lot slips through, which is why we're having this discussion. So do we have all the resources? Maybe no. Um, cutting the supply will cut the demand, of course. Cutting the demand will cut off the supply. So we, uh, all I can say is no, we don't have all the resources I'd like to have. We try to use every, every tool and every resource that I do have available to tackle it best we can. Well, let's talk about cutting the demand. Uh, Mark on Facebook wants to know, can the panelists talk more about prevention? How do we stop this in the first place? Oh yeah, that's such a, thank you Mark for that question because that's, that's the question and it's the same question that we ask right now for COVID, for example, the prevention efforts that we utilize and employ to, to keep the spread of this disease from kind of going through running rampant. We talked a little bit about the, the resources of interdiction. And, and, and I, I got to say that, that in my experience over the last couple of years, the idea of like, what are we doing different? We've been dealing with, some, with drug use for a century. Um, and and I think the question of what are we doing different is the first thing that we do different um, or what should we do different because now what we're doing is we're starting to say rather than go, have the pendulum all the way over here with use law enforcement to kind of stop the drugs and interdict and then swing the pendulum if that's not working all the way to just invest in treatment only treatment and not utilize law enforcement really we need that partnership um, and we need that equal kind of public safety, public health approach so that we can work together. And I think we've done a really great job of doing that in Hawaii. And then the prevention piece is the other major, major piece. One of the things that we're trying to change in, in, in ADAT is we spend, right now, we spend about 75% of our total budget on treatment and only about 25% of our total budget on, on prevention. And we'd like to kind of even that out a little bit because we know that even though we can't see it immediately, the impacts immediately, if we are successful in prevention, we're actually reducing the problem overall. So over the next few years, um, we're going to start to we're going to start to employ a lot more prevention efforts. Um, right? Um, I'll just I had to write some of these stats down just because I don't have them in my brain. But last year we did a survey, and 12 to 17 year olds. Um, over a quarter of Hawaii's total population of 12 to 7 year olds have used methamphetamine in the last year. We have to we have to invest more in prevention because otherwise, we're going to keep spinning our wheels down the stream um, with you know all of the stuff that we're doing. Not that that's not important. We need those kind of components, but we got to do prevention. So, so thanks, Mark. For <laughs> that, I mean that's a shocking statistic. 25 yeah. percent of 12 to 17 year olds. Yes. How? What kind of specific prevention me measures are you talking about? Well, uh, the same kinds of um, prevention me measures that we've talked about, right? Is is why do people, why do people end up becoming addicted to any substance? It's because there's underlying causes like um, uh, childhood trauma. Um, there's loneliness, there's family um, dynamics. We actually are seeing third generation methamphetamine use where the grandmother is, has a methamphetamine problem, uh, grandparents, uh, children, and then their children are now starting to get into methamphetamine. And so the family dynamics that, that Hannah talked about earlier, the socioeconomics of it. So all of those, um, you know, the idea of 
utilizing activities such as um, uh, sports and investing in making sure that that adolescents have those alternative choices and even if they do choose to use once in a while that we're we're encouraging different choices for them and making it making that choice the easier choice than to just start getting high mm. what resources are available to the family members because it does seem like if you have a drug user in your family that is going to affect the whole family whether they use drugs or not there is. I think I just wanted to add on to what Eddie said. So when we think about like what is the key to prevention, the biggest thing is having that open dialogue with everyone. There's still that stigma that's involved, that shame component, people not wanting to bring it up. I think that plays a lot into sort of the perpetuating of addiction. Um, other things that we can kind of look at too is like um, some of the family dynamics is really addressing like maybe it's not the child, maybe it's the parents, maybe parents need to get the help that they need. I heard something very alarming today. So I did a focus group with a couple of the clients um, at my facility and we were talking about like with the kids, like what are we seeing with kids and that there, what Eddie is saying is definitely what we're seeing right now but they're not using meth in a way where they're um, smoking it anymore, they're injecting it. So they're using needles. And I don't know why that change. You know, we, 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 we need more da data to figure out what's going on there. But to me, that was very alarming. Like I can see definitely that the kids increase use with meth, but now their route of use is moving from smoking to injecting. Uh, that's just so, so troubling. How do you think we reach those folks? Especially, you know, you're talking about people, um, some of the communities that you serve that are 100 miles out, you know, in very rural parts of Hawaii Island. And I think that, you know, we have a lot of rural parts of our state where it can be hard to get people those resources. So I think we do a very good job on the big island because it's, it's a matter of resources, but we do it subliminally. You know, we do events, big, large events, not pre-COVID, obviously, that brings in family, celebrates the community, but gets the messaging out there to people. So they're coming there, they think they're coming for some free stuff, some food, you know, games for the family, but really the whole event is geared towards providing that understanding and giving them the education that they need and really making it, um, removing that stigma that's blocking people from getting help. Carla's, <clears throat> excuse me, Carla has a question uh, for you, Judge, and she says, what are the success rate for drug court graduates? You know, we talked a lot about the recidivism, but, but how do people do in drug court? Uh, well, let me start with that. I, I think we're really an effective program. Drug courts across the nation have been studied for many years, and I think it's just very well documented that drug courts uh, have a positive impact on one of the traditional measures of success, recidivism. Uh, let me give you a statistic for our drug court here in the First Circuit. Uh, from 2017 through, I think, the end of 2020, <clears throat> we, um, we graduated 122 individuals. And we uh, did a look at the end of 2020, just looking at who had been arrested, not even convicted, which is sort of one of the traditional measures of recidivism, just have no charges. And I think we're at roughly 18%, which you know is not um, is not zero for sure, but compared to some other comparable groups, I, it's it's a really it's it's a very uh, good recidivism rate. You know, for instance, somebody uh, coming out of prison, maxed out term, they're going to be in the high 60s, you know, for their recidivism rate. So, um, I, I think. I'm, I'm sort of proud to say we do we do well in terms of rates. We've had since we started back in 1990, had roughly 1,500 participants, about a thousand graduated, which is um, I think overall not too bad given the rigors of that program. Um, also used to preside over mental health court and veterans treatment court, and they had comparable rates. So. And, and what about, there's, an, there's more questions about those, the young people that Eddie's talking about, 25%. Um, are those folks going before you in drug court? Is their, is their sort of path a little bit different in terms of the resources that are made available to them through the legal system? Well, I, I, I used to preside over our juvenile drug court. I was in family court the first time. And <clears throat> um, I mean, one of the, one of the traditional, uh, probably the best predictors of 
future substance use and, and honestly, um, a criminal behavior is the early onset of substance use. So it's not unusual, see, if they start that young, that that is a hard path to get off of. Um, so I have seen, you know, kind of the kids I knew back then on the adult side, when I was on the adult side. So it's, um, uh, it's I mean, troubling to say the least. Uh, so that uh, I'm, I'm complete with Eddie Hanna and I'm sure Major too, that the earlier we kind of intervene and give them a different way to live, to, um, you gotta go to school, right? You know, all those kind of traditional things, we wanna give people opportunities to succeed in the traditional conventional way. Um, that, that, that increases the odds that they're not going to end up in, in my court. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, it, school is so important, and we know that in the last year, a lot of kids didn't go to school. Now school has started up again, and hopefully with prevention me measures, people can continue with in-person learning. But what are your concerns about those kids who missed you know, a year of school and maybe were separated from their peer group or separated from educators who um, can do interventions just right there? Definitely. So I think the interesting thing for us right now, what we're trying to do is, it's, and it's a part of ADAD, is more of our school-based programming. Um, we've, I've had several meetings with principals on our island and they're just like in dire need to have us return because what they're seeing right now is just the increase in drug use, isolation, you know, more behavioral problems right now that are probably not even, you don't even realize. And so we are gonna be starting I mean, in fact, next week, again, within the schools to provide that support that they need. But I truly believe that it, it, it does take a village, you know, when, when the administration is on board and they're wanting you to be there to help the students, um, we're gonna be there and meet them at, at that need. The, the other thing that we're seeing that it's, that's very um, promising for us right now is not necessarily only providing the, the treatment component for these individuals, but also being a class that's scheduled for all like seventh or eighth graders to kind of give them that education. And it's not necessarily saying, say, you know, say no to drugs. It's really giving them other basic tools that, that gives them a fighting chance. So like goal setting, you know, thinking about the future, um, how, to, how to problem solve. All of these types of basic things are really prevention when it comes to you know, drug use. You know, another place where people encounter drugs uh, is, is prison. And there's a question here from Dan. It's a law enforcement question, so I'll pose it to you. I know you're not uh, a prison law enforcement, but how do you prevent ICE use in prison? Many ICE users end up in prison yet still get their hands on it in jail. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I can't really comment a lot on that. We do have some investigations into organizations that are trafficking it into the prison. And um, my personnel, we tackle it from that end. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't really go into detail on what the prison does to keep it out, but I, I, I'm not um, naive to think it's not a big problem. Yeah, Eddie, Eddie, what are your thoughts on drug use in prison? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously it's, it's there, and I, and I think, um, you know, again, it goes back to that idea of uh, the balanced approach, public safety, public health, right? So if people, people are going to find ways to get all kinds of things in prison that they're not supposed to have, um, and I think we can use the law enforcement approach to address that. But that only goes so far, um, and I think the other, so the other piece that we need to do, and I think um, Hannah touched on it a little bit as well, is uh, aside from us just telling, trying to get um, people who are struggling with addiction to figure out what they need to change or how they need to do um, to get better, we have to also look at ourselves in our own systems and kind of identify the pukas and the kind of paradigms that we need to shift. One paradigm that I'm hugely a champion of is changing the idea that substance use disorders are a, um, a characteristic failing of somebody um, and using our systems to be more engaging, less judgmental, more treating, treating this as a real disease. Imagine if we could, um, if the audience could even imagine, if we could eliminate all substance use disorders in Hawaii overnight. Imagine the impact that would have on crime. Imagine the impact that would have on homelessness. Imagine the impact that would have on domestic violence, all of that kind of stuff. We're never gonna be able to do that, but what we can do is we can change the way that we look at this disease and how we address it. 
if we start to use kind of the lessons that we've learned in terms of COVID and a pandemic, this is a communicable disease, let's just face it. People uh, attain substance use disorders oftentimes because of their environment, because of their family, because of who they're associating with, because they're engaged in environments where that is the norm. And if we can start to go back to that prevention piece and start to change it so that's not the norm, then we can start to change kind of the, the prevalence rates in prison and throughout the state. Yeah, Major, let's talk about some of those wider impacts. What are some of the crimes that are associated with meth use? What, what do you see from people who, who use this habitually? Well, um, like I said earlier, a, a lot of the individuals that um, end up in drug court and, and in the prison uh, who failed it, fail out of the drug court, the, the drug, the drug case in, that's against them is a secondary to what they were arrested for, you know, a burglary, a theft, um, some other crime. Usually the possession itself might lead someone to admitting they have a problem and are a candidate for, for a judge's program. As, as far as other crimes, I mean, you name it, anything, anything out there that will help to create a revenue to buy the drugs is, is open uh, as a product of the meth use. Hannah, you know, when I think, when parents hear you say that they're injecting this and when they hear Eddie's statistic about 25%, what do you say to families um, who may not have a history of drug use themselves, but they know that their kids may be exposed to this, uh, you know, socially or what have you, what is the conversation? How do you have that conversation at home? You talk a lot about opening a dialogue. What, what are the, how do you have that dialogue and what should you say other than don't do this. Of course, I think just just giving them permission to come forward. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with the stigma um, surrounded. You know, it doesn't happen in my house. That's what we hear often. And so sometimes that could be detrimental to the kid because obviously they're using, but parents are like too proud to sort of bring that forward. So I think it's really normalizing how we are accepting of someone who who's willing to come forward or just giving them the opportunity to come forward. Uh, there's a question here, and, and I, I'd like you to actually talk about this a little bit. It says, please comment on the high amount of violent incidents involving people who use meth. Physically, we hear about people who, you know, get very strong when they're on meth or they, you know, they seem to have some super strength or they're sort of out of their mind. Why is violent crime associated with this particular drug? I think it's obvious. I think it's the nature of the drug and the neurological sort of component and how they're able to just not really feel sometimes, I think. That's what I hear when we, when we talk, we have that conversation with individuals whose drug of choice is meth, you know, they just feel strong and mighty. You know, they don't feel anything. So I think a lot of uh, the violent crimes, uh, the, and not everybody is violent. That's the injury. I want to make that very clear. If you're if you're a user, doesn't you know user of meth? It doesn't necessarily mean that you're gonna you know be violent. It doesn't happen. Sometimes people don't have that presentation, but it's the ones that we see that end up in you know jail and prison that are violent, and it's connected to ICE. Um. This is a question for Major. Are you finding meth in homeless camps around the state, or is it everywhere? Um, it, it's everywhere. Yeah, and we are finding it in some homeless camps. Um, like I said, we could go blocks away from here and find meth. It, it's pretty much everywhere, which is why we're having this discussion. Um, Judge, I know that, you know, building on what Hannah was saying about the families and having that conversation, I'm sure that you've interacted with a lot of people who are hurt by this, even if they're not themselves not the drug user. What do you say to them on how they can help their family members? Because I, I'm sure for some it can feel pretty daunting. Yeah. I, <clears throat> um, you know, a lot of it is you, you just have to, um, when they lose hope, you have to retain that hope, even if it's forced. Um, you know, you you know, a lot of families, um, they need to um, make sure that their loved one, if their loved one's using, um, do everything they can get get some help, but but be honest about everything. You know, it's, it's, it's normal, you know, for someone not to want to address it or to deny it and not believe that it's true. Just be open and honest. Be as supportive as you can uh, because you know, in the right situation with the right kind of support, um, you know, pe people can um, 
can sustain their, re get into recovery and sustain the recovery. It may not feel like it at times, I'm sure. Um, and, and some of the behaviors associated with, you know, with people who are substance abusers, particularly methamphetamine, are really difficult behaviors. Relationships get ruined, um, but, you know, sort of, there is hope in the right setting and the right circumstances, don't give up. Eddie, we talked about people who use this um, and, and are sort of functional, or at least for a time. And so Paul's got a question kind of building on that. What are the physiological effects long term that meth has on the brain? If you're able to use meth and keep a job or keep a family, um, but what is that doing to you over time, even if you think you might not be affected at the moment? I think it's an excellent question. So to, to put it in non-scientific um, terms, Long-term methamphetamine use can result in something very similar to schizophrenia. So what, so, I mean, we, as far back as the 90s, we were doing studies on the impacts of methamphetamine use on the brain, and it essentially just uh, carves holes in your brain. So um, those are the long-term impacts. Associate, also some of the other associated ones are you know, um, deterioration of, of your teeth and muscle, muscular um, deterioration, all of that kind of stuff. And how long does that take to actually present? It's hard, it's, it, the, it, it ranges from um, around probably, I don't know what we say, I don't know, probably around five years. Uh, depends, on, depends on the severity of the use and, and the, reg, the regularity of the use, but within five years, you could start to see some of those impacts easily. We only have a few minutes left, and so I want to give each of you an opportunity to give us a final thought. Major, I'll start with you. Um, and if you could just tell us what we as a community should be doing to help address this problem. Well, from the law enforcement side, uh, anything that you can give us uh, with information on people you may suspect or a house like was mentioned earlier that you suspect drug use or drug trafficking, let us know about it. We take every complaint serious. Okay, and Judge, what, what, what would you tell the community? What can we do as a community for this? We'll work together, collaborate, because it, it truly does take, like Eddie was saying, it's you know, your public safety, you know, public health, um, just everybody kind of figure out ways to continue to collaborate. That's what drug court does. We're a collaborative court, and it, like I say, it's effective. Um, so I think that, mo that model, um, it has to be a multifaceted approach when everybody kind of does their part and, and keep talking about it because it's, it's endemic, as I said before. Yeah. Hannah, let's hear from you. Um, I just want to say I want to use this as a platform to not really look at the negativity of what, what, um, you know, what the addiction is all about, but just reaching out to people and saying that if you need help, help is out there. Yeah, and when you want to have that conversation, how do you, how do you actually start that? Just ask the question. I, I just basically say, how, how are you doing? How's things going? And usually you'll start, they won't tell you like I'm using drugs, but you know, you'll get, you'll slowly have that conversation with them and figure out really what's going on. But I'm gonna say like, we've seen people that have, have been very successful in treatment, that there is hope for individuals. If they need the help, just call, call us. Okay. And Eddie, tell us more about what we can do as a community to really help, because I think some people watching tonight may think that they, that they don't know anybody who uses this drug and that it doesn't really affect them. I, I, I would argue that, that most people in Hawaii do know somebody who has been impacted by substance use disorders and methamphetamine. And so just like, like everybody's saying is let's, let's work together, um, support law enforcement, support the public health effort. For me, um, uh, it, one of the things that can happen that would be helpful, I think, is if we as a society can give up on the idea that we're going to find a silver bullet answer. So these are complex issues. We need complex systems and responsive systems, and we need to have multifaceted approaches. Um, and we also need to start looking at this really, I mean, we talk about it as a disease, but we often don't treat it as a disease. We don't treat it like we would somebody with cancer or diabetes or heart conditions. And we often, uh, Hannah brought it up a lot, we often um, still kind of bring that stigma to um, people who are suffering from this disease. Is it a matter of having more compassion when you talk about treating it as a disease? What, what do you mean specifically? Well, I think absolutely there, it's a matter of having compassion, but I also, I also think it's a matter of us really um, kind of challenging our own paradigms, both 
individually and as a system, um, w would we really kick somebody out of um, substance abuse treatment for doing the very thing that, uh, like Judge was talking about, the relapse is part of the process, right? So do we kick people out or do we um, kick them to the curb? Would we do that for somebody who had diabetes and they were eating too much candy? We wouldn't. So the medical system treats people with those kinds of diseases a lot differently than we do um, people who are suffering from the disease of addiction. So I think just continuing to challenge our paradigms, continuing to have people challenge their paradigms, and, um, and like, like we've talked about, just reach out for help and let's talk about it some more. Okay, well, thank you all for being here tonight. We, of course, thank our guest, Senior Family Court Judge Matthew Viola, CEO of the Big Island Substance Abuse Council, Hannah Preston Pita, Major Philip Johnson from the Honolulu Police Department, and Edward Mercercero, Administrator for the Department of Health's Alcohol and Drug Abuse Division. Next week, right here on Insights, it's being called the Great Resignation. Employers are struggling because not enough people are returning to the workforce for a variety of reasons. So join us for COVID-19 Help Wanted. I'm Yanjin Nis for Insights on PBS Hawaii. Aloha.